Aufgabe, die dem Denken gestellt ist heute, wie ich es verstehe, ist in einer Weise neu, dass es eine ganz neue Methode des Denkens verlangt, Dieses Denken ist in der Sache sehr viel einfacher als die Philosophie, aber im Vollzug sehr viel schwieriger und verlangt eine neue Sorgfalt der Sprache. The renowned philosopher Martin Heidegger lived for the whole of his life in the Black Forest area of southern Germany. He looked, talked, and often acted like a typical German farmer, but he thought like nobody else alive. The moment one reads Heidegger, life is different afterwards. Now, there are lots of reasons why that's the case, but it has a lot to do with the power of the argument and its novelty, the I can't imagine ever having thought that before feeling. It just changes the way you view philosophy. As you get into it, it can become indispensable to one's own feeling of how thinking gets itself done. And to those who say, look, this isn't philosophy, I say, fine, I'm not terribly interested in the supermarket label, call it what you will. Are you able to cope? Are you able to live with its completely new, radical grasp on the world. More critical commentaries have been devoted to Heidegger than to any other philosopher apart from Aristotle. He is undoubtedly one of the most important figures in the history of 20th century thought. But not everyone who mentions his name today does so with approval. Two decades after his death in 1976, he is widely revered, but also widely reviled. And the explanation has to do not with philosophy, but with politics. There are two uncontestable facts about Heidegger. One is that he was a brilliant philosopher. The other was that he was a nefarious Nazi. I don't really blame him for thinking that Hitler was the salvation of Germany. Lots of reasonable people thought Hitler was the salvation of Germany. But they usually also thought that all this stuff about the Jews was just you know, window dressing and didn't really come to anything. What I find hard to forgive about Heidegger is after everybody knew about Auschwitz, knew what Hitler was leading up to, he just pretended that he hadn't really been there or had nothing to say or something like that. What sort of man was Martin Heidegger? How did he come to align himself with the most sinister political movement of modern times? And to what extent should his Nazi involvement be allowed to detract from his status as a thinker? Heidegger's story begins in the small town of Meskirch, where he was born in 1889 and laid to rest 87 years later. His parents, Friedrich and Johanna Heidegger, both came from peasant stock, but the family were comparatively well off, and young Martin never went without. His father was employed as a sexton at the small town's surprisingly grand Catholic church and religious observance played a major part in his early life. He served as an altar boy and seems to have decided before the age of 10 that he wanted to become a priest. He was small in stature as a child, but the power of his personality was apparent even then. Hans Jorger Gadamer, a student of Heidegger's during the 1920s, discovered as much when he visited Meskirch towards the end of that decade to find out more about his tutor's early life. 
Seventy years later, at the age of 98, Professor Gadamer, now a world-famous philosopher in his own right, remembers the visit well. I asked a old man on the street. He said, how was he actually? Der äh, Professor Heidegger, den kannten Sie doch sicher als Kind. Den Martin, ja natürlich kann ich den. Na, wie war er denn? Tja, wie soll man da sagen? Er war der Kleinste, er war der Schwächste, er war der äh, Unruhigste, äh, Unbrauchbarste von allen. Aber er hat uns alle kommandiert. Also was da so aus einer Ausstrahlung eines solchen Knaben zu spüren ist. Ich habe es dann später oft genug gemerkt, <lacht> wie äh, auch natürlich, wie schwer es ist, wenn jemand eine solche Ausstrahlungsmacht hat, sie nicht am falschen Gegenstand zu betätigen. In 1909, having received a grammar school education paid for largely by the church, Heidegger enrolled at the University of Freiburg, the city in which he was to spend the bulk of his working life. He started off as a student of Catholic theology, but his faith in God suddenly began to weaken, leading him to change his subject first to mathematics, then to philosophy. His interest in this field had been aroused by the work of one of his professors, Edmund Husserl. He was the originator of an important philosophical movement known as phenomenology, which offered a new understanding of human consciousness. Husserl took the promising young scholar under his wing, doing everything he could to promote his career, a kindness Heidegger would later repay in the most callous way imaginable. Before Husserl's sponsorship had time to take effect, Heidegger found himself caught up in the First World War not as a frontline soldier, but in several less hazardous roles. Er hat später diese Zeit des Ersten Weltkriegs als heroische Zeit für sich in Anspruch genommen. Das stimmt natürlich nicht. Er war, wenn man so will, einer, der versucht hat, möglichst lange nicht an die Front zu müssen. Das muss man einfach sagen. Er hat einen Dienst, der quasi militärisch gewesen ist, nämlich bei der Postzensur in Freiburg angetreten und ist erst am Schluss des Krieges, also seit Juli 1918, als Meteorologe, als Wetterwart eingesetzt worden. Das war in der Westfront, hinter der Front, vor allen Dingen um die Windverhältnisse für den Gaskrieg einzustufen, dass man also wusste, wenn Westwind trifft ist und eine besondere Gefahr für die deutschen Truppen bestand. While the war was still going on, Heidegger married the woman who would remain at his side for the rest of his life, an attractive economic student called Elfriede Petri, who soon bore him two sons. In 1923, when the boys were still small, the family moved to Marburg in central Germany, where Husserl had helped Heidegger find himself a job as an associate professor of philosophy. Heidegger never took to Marburg, however, and whenever he could, he made his way back to the Black Forest. His destination was a simple wooden hut he'd had specially constructed for himself on the slopes of a mountain called Totnerberg. This was to be his spiritual home for the rest of his life, somewhere he could always find the solitude he needed for his work. The family spent time here as well, though, and it's a place to which Heidegger's younger son, Hermann, remains deeply attached. Remains deeply attached. So, hier ist also unser Wohnzimmer. Da hinten ist die Küche, wo meine Mutter gekocht hat. Da hinten haben wir noch ein Bett. Wir haben alle Weihnachten hier oben gefeiert. Sind mit Rucksack und Skiern hier angekommen und haben hier das Weihnachtsfest gefeiert. So, jetzt zeige ich Ihnen noch das Studierzimmer. Das ist also das Studierzimmer, wo mein Vater viele Sachen geschrieben hat 
Er konnte hier oben am besten arbeiten. Und dann saß er hier an dem Tisch und schaut auf den Stüben Vasen raus. Auf den Brunnen. Der hat für meinen Vater eine besondere Bedeutnis. Wenn wir heute hier auf der Hütte sind, Herr Heidegger, erinnert Sie das sehr an Ihren Vater? Ja, natürlich. Er lebt hier für mich noch. Und äh, auch ich gehe sehr gerne hier rauf. Und wenn ich selber eine besonders schwierige Arbeit zu machen habe, sitze ich manchmal auch hier an diesem Schreibtisch und arbeite hier, weil das hier besonders gut geht. Totnerberg had a profound effect on Heidegger's personality. His long stays there appear to have reinforced his sense of himself as a true son of the Black Forest. And before long, he'd begun to cultivate a somewhat eccentric, rustic image. Heidegger's physique early on was a kind of invention of self. The insistence on peasant style clothes, the black forest way of speaking, chopping his own wood, his lonely hut high up in the hills at Totnauberg. Nothing, I think, would have alerted one to the immensity of the work and of the thought. Hans Jorge Gadamer is one of the few people outside the philosopher's immediate family to have visited him at the hut. He vividly recalls Heidegger's curious manner and appearance, but he also remembers something else. He saw me so a bit like a na ja, so halber und halber Monteur oder sowas aus, Handwerker oder sowas. Aber die Augen, da sah ich, da war Fantasie in einem ganz anderen Grade. Als wie etwa bei Husserl oder den anderen großen Namen Natov, die ich so kannte. During the early 1920s, having broken decisively with the Catholic Church, Heidegger also began to distance himself from his mentor Edmund Husserl. Whereas Husserl was intent on illuminating the innermost workings of the mind, Heidegger became convinced that what thinkers like himself should really be addressing was the ordinary person's everyday experience of the world. This conviction led him to write what is generally regarded as his masterpiece, the dense, evocative, strangely worded text known as Sein und Zeit, or to use its English title, Being and Time. This work is a tour de force of philosophical writing. One can't help in reading it to be simply amazed and astounded. It also, viewed historically, was the moment in which phenomenology, that which hitherto had been the dominant philosophical uh, mode of thinking, was called into question, but called into question in such a radical way that it became almost impossible to go back to phenomenology and continue with it. At the heart of being and time, and therefore of Heidegger's philosophy as a whole, is one deceptively simple question. What is really meant by the verb to be? We all think we understand what we mean when we say that someone or something is, but do we? Or are we, as Heidegger thought, letting the familiarity of the word itself blind us to what is really the greatest mystery of all? Do we, in our time, have an answer to the question of what we really mean by the word being? Not at all. But are we nowadays even perplexed at our inability to understand the expression being? Not at all. Our aim in the following treatise is to work out the question of the meaning of being and to do so concretely. Our provisional aim is the interpretation of time as the possible horizon for any understanding whatsoever of being. Immanuel Kant, a no small figure he, had said that space and time were equally important. They were the way we organized our world. The very young Heidegger never forget he's writing this as a very, very young man. Says not at all. Uh, space is an almost insignificant category. Time is the mystery. 
Time and human existence are inextricably linked, according to Heidegger. Our being, he says, is really a process of becoming. And this key insight leads him to reject the idea that there is such a thing as a fixed human essence. Heidegger's major contribution in Being in Time is to show how the old Aristotelian essence of man as the rational animal is, in effect, an abstraction. Because what comes first is man's own existence. And existence for Heidegger is nothing but this, this stretching, whereby we are constantly projecting ourselves into a future, always expecting things, always hoping things. Heidegger is a man who first wanted to investigate how practical action shows that we're pulled ahead of ourselves into purposes that we're trying to fulfill, into tasks that we're working on. Think of a farmer in the Black Forest, for example, making a barrel. This is someone who has a future task that he's trying to fulfill, and he has a logic operating there that shows that the human being is actually extended ahead of himself. The ahead is where we really live, what we desire to do, what we anticipate, what we want this wood to turn out to be. People who live and work in traditional rural communities have an instinctive grasp of their own humanity, according to Heidegger. They are fully absorbed in and connected to the world, but they are also a clear minority of the human race. Heidegger argues that most of us, especially those who live in big modern cities, tend to lose touch with our individuality. Forced to conform to patterns of mass behavior, we experience strong feelings of anxiety, he says, and end up leading what he calls inauthentic lives. Most of us live what he called a life of one. One is one. One does this. One thinks that. Uh, one moves in this way. And he's saying to you, no, the I is not one. And this was in the 1920s sheer breathtaking prophecy before the great mass market detergents of standardized life and death which has swept over us. The the consumerism even of our deaths, they don't belong to us anymore. And he gave the great warning. He said, as this soap powder spreads over the planet, over the universe, it will be almost impossible for you to be you and not just one. Being and time was to make Heidegger's name once and for all. But before it was even published, he started to be spoken of as an original and explosive thinker. Drawing on his unpublished theories, he gave a series of brilliant lectures at Marburg University, which had a huge impact on all those who heard them. One young woman in particular found herself overwhelmed. She was Hannah Arendt, a talented and beautiful Jewish student who would later achieve world fame as a commentator on the evils of Nazism. Arendt became a pupil of Heidegger's in 1924. He was immediately struck by her and before long they had embarked on a brief but passionate affair. She knew that she was with uh, a man who had a, a reputation in German intellectual circles for being, she sometimes later put it, a secret king of, uh, of philosophy. But she was also very remarkable, and both of them seemed to have conceptualized this relationship as a mystical event and she remained loyal to it because it had been so formative because it had been so formative when being in time was finally published in 1927 shortly after his affair with Arendt came to an end Heidegger became famous overnight Despite its daunting complexity, the book was bought and read by educated men and women throughout Germany. Its success was due in large part to the troubled and questioning spirit of the time. Heidegger's existential point of departure in being in time 
satisfied the needs of a generation, the needs of a generation that was lost in the aftermath of World War I, and for which questions of, of existence, the wherefore and whither of human existence, were absolutely central. The book caused ripples of excitement, not just in Germany, but all over the world. And in 1928, Heidegger returned in triumph to Freiburg University, taking over the chair of philosophy left vacant by the retirement of Edmund Husserl. At the relatively young age of 39, he had suddenly acquired the status of a major philosopher. But within a few years, he would tarnish his reputation forever by embarking on a calamitous political adventure. On January the 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. He immediately launched a process of restructuring designed to eliminate so-called non-Aryans from public office and clamp down on all forms of dissent. Towards the end of April, after the rector of Freiburg University had resigned in protest at these measures, Heidegger astonished almost everyone who knew him by allowing his name to be put forward in the ballot to elect a successor. He was duly elected by an almost unanimous vote of the university's governing body, although 13 of the professors who would normally have been entitled to vote were forbidden to do so because they were Jews. A week later, Heidegger delivered his inaugural address as rector to a capacity audience in the university's main hall specially bedecked for the occasion with swastika flags. Then, on May the 1st, a symbolic date in the Nazi calendar, he officially joined the party, thereby winning the gratitude of all those who wished to see Hitler succeed. The first few months of Nazi rule were by no means a sure thing. It was still a bit of a tenuous operation, so the initial months were very important. And this was the specific finding of the University Denazification Commission that Heidegger had played an essential role in placing Hitler into the saddle by serving to legitimate the regime on the basis of his immense worldwide philosophical prestige. Those who had known the Wizard of Meskirch during his days at Marburg University were stunned and appalled when they heard what he had done. Also, ich kann jetzt nicht nur, brauche jetzt nicht nur von mir zu sprechen sondern von allen seinen Schülern. Wir waren fassungslos. Wir hätten das für vollkommen unmöglich gehalten. Äh, es, man legt jetzt sehr oft Wert darauf, und das ist natürlich nicht ganz falsch, wie war dieser Irrtum von ihm möglich. Das heißt also, wir damals dachten, er ist verrückt geworden. Why did Heidegger attach himself so firmly to the Nazi cause? What factors, other than personal ambition, impelled him to act as he did? Part of the explanation seems to lie in the closeted rural culture from which he and Hitler both emerged. Heidegger grew up a very conservative Catholic in a very conservative southwest Germany. He was a rural man, not very comfortable with urban life. Nazism claimed to offer a preservation of a more simple rural life at the same time as it promised a tempered move into the technological 20th century. I think this was a great appeal to Heidegger. Nazism also was famous for its anti-Semitism, and I think Heidegger shared in the cultural anti-Semitism of his nation of that time without yielding, I believe, to the crude biological anti-Semitism of Hitler. He didn't need Hitler to be an anti-Semite. He had that already from his culture. At the period of 1933, as far as I can see, Hitler did not promise the physical murderous destruction of the Jews but an elimination of their roles in society in such a way that Heidegger would say yes, he would agree with that. The claim that Heidegger was anti-Semitic is one that's often denied, 
not least by members of his family. His son, Hermann, for instance, points out that the philosopher had many Jewish friends, including both Edmund Husserl and Hannah Arendt. However, the evidence that points to him having a deep antagonism towards Jewish culture as a whole, as opposed to individual Jews, is too compelling to ignore. In 1929, Heidegger wrote a letter to a friend of his to say that Germany now is at a crossroads. Either it goes down the road of the Jewification of German culture, or it continues down the other road to the rest restoration of greater Germany. Now the word Heidegger used for Judung is a very anti-Semitic term. You will not find it in even the biggest German dictionaries. However, you will find it in Mein Kampf, where Hitler used it in exactly the same terms. Another telling piece of evidence came to light purely by chance when Professor Rainer Martin, a one-time student of Heidegger's, stumbled across an old book about Hermann Goering. When he opened it, he was astounded to discover it had once belonged to his former tutor. Ein wahrhaft schlimmes Buch. Heidegger hat es einem Freund geschenkt, und zwar dem Kunsthistoriker Janssen, so steht auch hier darin, der lieben Familie Janssen zur Erinnerung an den 3. März 1933 in Freundschaft Martin Heidegger. Liest man in diesem Buch, und ich habe es natürlich gelesen, dann erschaudert einen, was ein angeblich großer Geist in jenen dunklen Jahren getan hat. Es ist ein widerwärtiges Schreibstück von A bis Z äh, mit Böswilligkeiten. Auch der Untermensch fehlt nicht, den es auszumerzen gilt. Und das schenkt man einem anderen hochstehenden Geist. Und er findet das auch noch hübsch und legt bescheiden, ebenfalls Unsinniges aus der Zeitung ausgeschnitten, über diesen Herrn Göring mit hinein. Heidegger appears to have hero-worshipped Hitler and his cronies quite as slavishly as any Bavarian housewife, and there can be little doubt that his adulation had its roots in a shared inheritance of racial prejudice. But he also seems to have detected a strong affinity between the Nazi creed and certain tenets of his own philosophy. In virtually all Heidegger's lectures and texts from the 1920s, he'd been calling for some kind of notion of community. And of course, one of the linchpins of Nazi ideology was the idea of a national community that would unite all Germans. So when Heidegger put the hesitant approaches of his philosophy together with the realities of Germany in 1933, he thought that aspects of his texts and his doctrines had actually come to life. What he seems to have done is to have uh, broadened the notion of individual authenticity and applied it to the people, to the folk. And I think that this led him finally out of the uh, university library into the streets to identify with National Socialism, which he thought of as the realization of his own theory. Heidegger wasn't sure, however, that Nazism was safe with the Nazis. What Hitler needed, he thought, was a guide, someone who could ensure that the Nazi revolution fulfilled its true potential someone that is, exactly like himself. Heidegger suffered, to be sure, from megalomania. He succumbed to the delusion, and one can only call it a delusion, that uh, he could play the role of philosopher king following Plato's problematic precedent to Hitler and the Third Reich. He thought he, he could get the ear of the new regime and be the eminence glees behind Hitler or whoever was going to run the country. And he, he seriously believed that if you got the right philosopher in the right place, things might be different. Germany would be revitalized, Europe would be revitalized, everything might be wonderful and different. Convinced of his ability to steer the revolution in what he saw as the right direction, Heidegger became not just a Nazi, but a Nazi fanatic. Someone prepared to demonstrate his devotion to the cause by the most underhand means. Prepared to demonstrate his devotion to the cause by the most underhand means. We now know, we didn't know until recently, 
that he spent a good deal of time writing the most damning letters about colleagues, ratting on them to the local police and even the Gestapo for being politically incorrect or not enthusiastic enough about the Nazi revolution or for having been pacifist during World War I. The most prominent victim of Heidegger's denunciatory campaign was Hermann Staudinger, a professor of chemistry at Freiburg, who would later be awarded the Nobel Prize. In Freiburg State Archive, Professor Hugo Ott has unearthed hard documentary evidence which shows that during 1933 and 1934, Professor Staudinger was hounded by the Gestapo purely as a result of malicious gossip passed on by Heidegger. The documents reveal that on the 29th of September 1933, the philosopher held a meeting in his office at Freiburg University with a senior Nazi official. He had requested the meeting himself, with the sole aim of communicating politically damaging allegations regarding Staudinger's supposed conduct during the First World War. Heidegger alleged that the scientist had been both a pacifist and a spy and that he'd handed over manufacturing secrets related to Germany's chemical weapon production to hostile foreign powers. As a result of these claims, which eventually proved to be groundless, the future Nobel Prize winner was subjected to several months of surveillance and hostile interrogation. To ensure there would be no let-up in the investigation, Heidegger helpfully wrote to the Gestapo's regional commander informing him how he thought the case should now be handled. Und Heidegger führt die einzelnen Punkte der Gestapo Untersuchungen auf und kommt dann am Schluss seines Briefes zu dem Antrag, den er als Rektor stellt, dass Staudinger aufgrund seiner politischen Vergangenheit, die negativ ist jetzt im neuen Deutschland, nicht mehr an der Universität Freiburg lehren darf, sondern dass er auch nicht einmal pensioniert werden darf, sondern entlassen. Das heißt also, ohne Bezüge aus dem Staatsdienst zu entfernen ist. Und Heidegger unterschreibt das eigenhändig, Heil Hitler, Heidegger. Ein schlimmer Brief wäre er bekannt gewesen, 1945 Heidegger hätte nie eine Chance gehabt, in der Universität heimisch zu werden. Of all those who suffered at Heidegger's hands, no one had more cause to feel betrayed than Edmund Husserl, the man who did so much to launch his career. Shortly before Heidegger took over as rector, Husserl was sent a circular letter banning him from using any of Freiburg University's facilities because he was a Jew. When Heidegger took office, he could easily have rescinded this order, but he chose not to. The effect on his old master was devastating. Husserl war furchtbar getroffen, aber er war ein Philosoph, der auch eine gewisse stoische Komponente hatte, also gelassen, alles zu ertragen. Und, ähm, äh, aber er war innerlich äh, fast zerstört, das muss man sagen. Und Husserl hat dann in verschiedenen Briefen an enge Freunde äh, seine große Trauer zum Ausdruck gebracht über äh, diesen äh, Irrweg seines ehemaligen Schülers und seines gewissermaßen Sohnes, geistigen Sohnes. Stories like this are shameful enough, but many people are convinced that Heidegger bears an even greater burden of guilt. That's because of the part he played in convincing impressionable young people all over Germany to put their faith in Hitler. <laughs> Professor Raymond Klebanski, an internationally respected scholar now aged 93, was an undergraduate in Heidelberg when the Nazis came to power. He's convinced that Heidegger exerted a disastrous influence on an entire generation of German students. On the 30th of June, I was there, 33, he gave a speech to all the professors and students of Heidelberg in which he urged uh, the audience to abandon all these humanist and Christian ideals, not to let themselves be weakened by them and uh, to become true national socialists. And here Heidegger is a guilty man in the sense that he is 
responsible for the allegiance of a large part of the academic youth to Hitler. In April 1934, Heidegger stood down as rector of Freiburg University. After the war, he claimed he had done so in protest at Nazi excesses, but his real motivation seems to have been a deep sense of frustration at the meagerness of what he'd achieved. His disillusionment with National Socialism is not a disillusionment with National Socialism. It's a disillusionment with the possibility that a political party could enact the thorough change that he wants and which has emerged from his study of the history of philosophy. Chastened by his ill-fated dalliance with worldly affairs, Heidegger returned to the life of the mind. He began once again to spend as much time as possible at Totnaberg, where his thought gradually entered a new phase. The move from the period of the rectorate into the 40s and 50s, all the way to his death, is a move to poetry and to language in particular as the space, where, uh, the place where one should look at one's relation to being and to history as a whole. Every great poet has intuited this, but Heidegger has said it, that it is not we who speak language, but language which speaks us. It structures our world. It structures our sense of time, of identity, of human relations, of love, of violence, and so on. And so when Foucault very, very radically and brilliantly says, there is no more man, uh, there is no more author, etc., etc., when deconstruction speaks of language as an autonomous, inward-turning game, as a dance around an infinity of possible meanings, these are footnotes to Heidegger. From the collapse of his rectorship till the end of the war, Heidegger took no further part in public affairs. But official records recently discovered in Berlin show that he remained a member of the Nazi party until the day it ceased to exist. A fact few people realized, even at the time. The philosopher's nephew, Heinrich Heidegger, who still tends the modest grave in Meskirch Cemetery where his uncle lies buried, was a schoolboy during the war. He vividly recalls the moment he first realized that his distinguished relative was a Nazi party member. In January 1944, he invited me to eingeladen nach Freiburg, um manuscripts and abschriften to bergen einzuladen und uh, nach Meskirch zu transportieren. Aber interessant ist, er hat mich auf den Zug begleitet in Freiburg. Da muss man noch etwas warten. Und sagt dann, stell dir vor, jetzt müssen wir das Parteiabzeichen tragen. Dann frage ich ihn, ja, bist du in der Partei? Das war für mich wie eine Offenbarung. Ich war ein Gegner der Partei, wie die ganze Familie bei uns. Ich war ein Gegner der Partei, wie die ganze Familie bei uns. By the time this conversation took place, the pressure was mounting for Heidegger, as it was for everyone else in Germany. The war was turning into a rout, and Hitler's days were clearly numbered. On November the 27th, 1944, Freiburg was subjected to a massive bombing raid, and the university, which sustained heavy damage, had to be abandoned. The philosophy department relocated en masse to Castle Wildenstein, a medieval fortress overlooking the upper Danube Valley, while Heidegger himself was put up a few miles away by one of his favorite students, Princess Margot von sachsen meiningen with whom he was having an affair. He stayed in the princess's hunting lodge for several months, keeping well away from Freiburg until he could tell how he might be treated by the French troops, who'd taken charge of the city. Sein Verhalten 1933 
war ja dann für viele ein Anstoß. Und da wusste er nicht, wie es ihm ergehen wird. Darum hat er sie in diesen ersten Wochen äh, nach Kriegsende praktisch versteckt. As it turned out, Heidegger was quite right to be concerned. Within a few weeks of Freiburg's surrender, French officials arrived at his home on the outskirts of the city. They carefully surveyed the house and its contents, and then informed Elfrieda Heidegger, who was living there alone, that the property would be requisitioned for use by Allied personnel, because its owner was known to have been a leading Nazi party member. This threat was soon lifted, thanks to a certain amount of string pulling by Heidegger's friends. But the philosopher could see the way things were going, and he soon decided to return to Freiburg and face the music. Herr Dr. Heidegger, Sie wurden am 21. April 1933 zum Rektor der Universität. He duly appeared in front of a special denazification commission, composed of members of the university faculty who'd been opposed to the Nazi regime. Stehen Sie zu dieser Aussage? Diese Fragen sind nicht fair. He was subjected to rigorous questioning, but he put up a spirited defense to all the accusations leveled at him, and the proceedings dragged on for several months without any firm conclusions emerging. Eventually, to try to resolve matters once and for all, the commission members wrote to a former colleague of Heidegger's, the respected philosopher Karl Jaspers, asking what course of action he would recommend. Jaspers replied that Heidegger's unfree and dictatorial mode of thinking meant he should be banned from teaching for five years. And this is precisely what the French military authorities eventually decreed. The true effect their action had on him has only recently become clear. Heidegger had selbst ja einem Biographen gesagt, er sei zusammengebrochen im Zuge dieser ganzen Untersuchungen. Er stellt das aber in einer Weise dar, die nicht haltbar ist. Er ist in der Tat zusammengebrochen. Er war ähm, suizidgefährdet, ist gerettet worden und hat dann einen mehrmonatigen Aufenthalt antreten können mit Hilfe seines väterlichen Freundes, des Erzbischofs Konrad Kröber aus Messkirch, der ja für ihn wichtig gewesen ist von Anfang an, konnte er dort in einem Sanatorium äh, wieder geheilt werden. Heidegger was now at his lowest ebb, and yet within a few years, he would stage a remarkable recovery. Almost as soon as the war ended, he began to be cited as a key intellectual influence by several up-and-coming philosophers, most notably Jean-Paul Sartre, whose book Being and Nothingness was conceived as a companion piece to Heidegger's Being and Time. When Heidegger resumed teaching again in the early 50s, the support of Sartre and other existentialist thinkers helped to re-establish him as a major academic star. Es ist die Zeit, in der wir in Deutschland allgemein als restaurative Zeit rechnen müssen. In dieser Zeit kommt er wie der Vogel aus der Asche, wie Phönix aus der Asche, zu neuem Leben. Und zu neuer Anerkennung, ja, zu einer unerwarteten, äh, großen Anerkennung international. Das ist ein Wunder, so wie das deutsche Wirtschaftswunder ein Wunder sein mag, vielleicht. The one person, other than Sartre, who did most to restore Heidegger's damaged reputation, was his former lover, Hannah Arendt, who had been forced to leave Germany in the early 30s and settle in New York. There, in a small brownstone apartment on the Upper West Side, where she lived with her husband, she had begun to produce the stream of writings that would make her famous as a penetrating commentator on Nazism, to which she would forever attach the often quoted phrase, the banality of evil. At the end of the war, Arendt wrote a fierce letter to Karl Jaspers, calling Heidegger a potential murderer because of his treatment of Edmund Husserl. But when the former lovers met again face to face, her view of him softened. The meeting took place in Freiburg on the 7th of February 1950. Arendt was visiting the city in connection with work she was carrying out on behalf of a special body set up to recover Jewish property stolen by the Nazis. She sent Heidegger a note telling him of her arrival, and that evening he visited her in her hotel. 
he memorialized the meeting with a poem, and she said that uh, conversation took up uh, as though no time had intervened. So I think you can see that this relationship existed on another plane as far as both of them were concerned than the worldly uh, one in which the hotel was situated. She reports that he is contrite about his involvement with the Nazis, but not in any very knowing way, that he doesn't really understand himself and he doesn't understand the significance of what he's done. She'll exchange letters with Karl Jaspers in which they shrug their shoulders and say, it's his character, uh, there's nothing to be done about it, like he's a fool, uh, and uh, in, in many ways he was. Hannah Arendt never entirely forgave Heidegger for his Nazi past, but she does seem to have accepted most of his explanations for what he did during the Third Reich at face value. She worked tirelessly from 1950 onwards to promote his work in America, thereby completing his extraordinary rehabilitation. Hannah Arendt had publicly taken position against the Nazis. She was known to be Jewish. She emigrated to America. Uh, the fact that she would defend Heidegger made it look as if there was finally nothing to reproach him with. What is perhaps most troubling about Heidegger's post-war revival is that he never apologized for what he had done during the 30s, or uttered a clear denunciation of Hitler and his crimes. Even the murder of six million Jews was an event about which he seems to have felt no obligation to speak. He resumes teaching and literally the philosophic and literary world looks to him come on speak out say something human on the horror on the Shoah on the genocide on the Holocaust nothing nothing now that's where my bafflement and rage begins when Heidegger died in 1976 it was the sage who was remembered in all the obituaries not the practicing Nazi. But as the full extent of his involvement with the Third Reich has come to light over the past 20 years, a painful reassessment of his place in the history of philosophy has slowly begun. It's still not clear what the verdict will finally prove to be. He may well come to be seen as the greatest thinker of our age, as his supporters predict. But it's also possible that the grave defects of his personality his arrogance, pettiness, and lack of human feeling will rob him of the status he thought he was destined to achieve. There are a lot of cases of bad men writing interesting books, and Heidegger is just a spectacular case of that sort. He stumbled into a situation that he didn't have the character to get himself out of, and for the rest of history, he's always going to be stuck in the trap in which he mired himself.